forward to it. Did you want to, is Sarah around? I'm sure she's sort of done. Um, I think she's gonna put it up, but okay. we can go and find her and find her. Yeah, you're great. Although well, um, one of my guests has arrived, so. Okay. You did have a quick frame. Oh, great. Good, Just okay. So yes. a bit of frame. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, yes, but I can I can um, leave. I've got another guest who can also host. <laughs> Lovely. So I come equipped with a host as well as a guest or two. And that is that. Becky Miller is coming back by herself. Borrow her, yes, because Hannah Freeman backed out. This is another person yeah. who was yeah. going to, because I've got, I, I think I've got something that's saying yes, coming in. So, you know, you just need other people to sort of talk to them and so forth. Yes. Yeah, yes. Well, if you're down, feel free to, to do that, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, do you, do, well, I, I'll go back to my um, my entourage <laughs> in the <laughs> lobby. Definitely. Yeah. Can catch up with you in a minute. Great, right, thanks.
We did, but... Um, this is fresh. Yeah, that looks great, actually. I'll take that away. All right. well, thank you. Okay. The glass looks nice and warm. Thank you.
with us. My name is Vic Ritchie and I work for St Andrew the Great, which is a church in the city centre of Cambridge. Um, we're delighted to be able to host this event this evening and we're even more delighted that you've all come to join us. Um, I'm just going to run through the format of this evening so we all know what's happening um, and then I'll introduce you to Sharon who's going to be speaking to us in a few minutes. Um, after Sharon has spoken, there'll be um, a couple of minutes where um, we can chat with each other and write down any questions that have arisen um, from her talk. And um, you should all have question cards and pens, um, and then um, we'll gather those in, and uh, Sharon will try and answer as many of them as we can get through in the time that we've got. And then after that, um, please feel free to go back into that lovely room we're in before, and there'll be um, some more wine and some coffee as well, so we can um, enjoy the rest of the evening together. We're really glad that Sharon's come to join us today. Um, Dr. Sharon Derrick, um, lovely to have you with us tonight. Um, Sharon, you don't live in Cambridge at the moment. Can you just tell us a little bit about where you come from today and about your home situation? Absolutely. A little hint there, though, that I used to live in Cambridge. So um, it's great to be back. Um, yes, I live in Oxford. Um, I've lived there for the last 14 years. And uh, I lived there with my husband, Conrad and my two children, Abby, who is 11, and Ethan, who is 9. So, a little bit about us. Great. And the talk that you're going to give us tonight is from a Christian perspective. Um, is that a perspective you've always had? Have you always been a Christian? Yeah, thank you. Um, no, I haven't actually always um, been a Christian. I was um, raised in a uh, very loving, but I guess religiously neutral home. and. Um, kind of began um, asking questions as a teenager. I remember as a, as a young child maybe th thinking, why can I think? I suddenly had an awareness that I'm a person that is conscious and why is that? And, um, and then I, I think I really uh, began asking questions as a teenager. Um, I remember my, uh, I, was, I knew from an early age that I was a scientist. Um, I decided that I wanted to do a PhD as a teenager. Um, and I remember my A-level biology teacher um, <coughs> giving me this book by someone called Richard Dawkins. Um, and it was, this was in the 1980s, and the, the book was The Selfish Gene, and that had just been out for uh, a few years at that point. And um, I read this book about how we are you know, genetic machines, and the purpose of our life is entirely physical, and um, you know, our DNA accounts for everything. Um, and uh, the purpose of life can be summed up in terms of, you know, the, the role that we play in transference of our DNA um, and that sort of thing. And so I really absorbed that, actually. I didn't really think too much about it. I just absorbed this view from this person that I greatly respected. Um, and so I arrived at university um, in Bristol assuming that, you know, science and God were at odds with each other. Um, and I um, went to, actually on the very first night of the very first week uh, in my time at Bristol to a guerrilla Christian event, which has nothing to do with barbecuing, um, although they did used to barbecue Christians in the first and second century, but hopefully they won't return to that. Um, and I put my hand up and said, surely you can't believe in God and be a scientist at the same time. And I was told, yes. You can, um, and this was quite literally uh, rocket science for me. I just, I'd never heard even a very simplistic answer to that question, and that started me on a journey. There's lots more that could be said about that, and it was actually halfway through this biochemistry degree that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. After a lot of um, looking at the evidence, of asking, is this a blind leap you're asking me to take, or is there? actually more to it than that. And so, um, I, yeah, I turned to Christ halfway through my biochemistry degree when the Human Genome Project was just getting going and all of these, um, you know, leaps forward in our understanding of the molecular biology of the human body were really um, taking leaps forward. It was an incredible time to be in biochemistry. And, um, yeah, and it was incredible to actually return to the lab and not only be studying the world, but actually be knowing the God that made it. And those two, absolutely no reason why they can't go together. In fact, you could make a case that they're made to go together. That actually increases the sense of wonder as you study the world. 
Um, I'm sure lots of us would love to hear you speak more on that, the kind of interplay between science and faith, but it's, it's not the main subject that you're speaking to us about tonight. Um, you're speaking on this subject, why would God allow suffering? And I guess for lots of us that's a difficult question, it's difficult intellectually to get our heads around, it might be difficult emotionally as well. Um, what's led you to want to speak on this subject? Yeah, thank you. I, um, I you know, a, a, a process really. Um, I often find that even, um, although sometimes the presenting question is, is a highly intellectual and, and scientific question, often when, when I um, ask some more questions, it seems that behind that is some experience or suffering or having ab ob observed someone else suffer or having suffered even at the hands of the church in some way. And so I, I feel like actually suffering, the question of if God exists, then why is the world so messed up? And why are the you know, things just not as it seems they should be? Uh, that feels to me like the, the, the biggest objection of all to the Christian faith. And the strongest argument against the Christian faith, why on earth did God let that happen? And you're asking me to consider him. Well, you know, that, that's too big a leap to make. I feel like that is really the biggest objection to the Christian faith. And so um, the organization that I work for in Oxford is called the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. And really what we want to do there is not shy away from the hard questions. And, you know, if something is true, even if you ask the hardest questions of it, it will not crumble underneath you. Uh, it won't collapse underneath you. If something is true, well, it will stand even up to very hard questions. And so I wanted to address this question. Um, and not just from an intellectual question, but from the reality of life as well, the, the, the lived reality that we all have, and how you marry what you believe to be true and how you actually live. Try and marry those two together. And you've actually written a whole book on this, haven't you? Um, so we're just getting a kind of snippet of that tonight. Yes. Um, yes, and what the book does is pull those two things together by looking at some of the questions that people ask. If God exists, then why suffering? Uh, if God is so powerful, why doesn't he stop it? Uh, you know, why doesn't God get rid of evil and suffering once and for all? But then I, I weave it with stories of people who do believe in God, who are Christians, and have suffered and continue to suffer. And it shares their story in their words. They were interviewed and their words were transcribed. And so it's their voice that you hear. Um, so it's the intellectual questions and people's stories working together. And we'll say a bit more about Shan's book later on. Um, Sharon, thank you again for coming um, to speak to us. Sharon will be speaking to us shortly. And um, before that, um, we're just going to watch um, a short clip. Um, so I'm going to make my way over here and hope it works. Some of you might have seen this before. Um, it's a clip that's been um, widely available um, and from a couple of years ago. And you will definitely recognise at least one of the participants in it. Suppose what Oscar believed in as he died, in spite of your protestations, suppose it's all true, and you walk up to the pearly gates and you are confronted by God, what will Stephen Fry say to him, her, or it? I will basically, that is the odyssey, I think, I, I'll say, bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? That's what I'd say. And you think you're going to get in? No, I don't but I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to get in on his terms. They're wrong. Now, if I died and it was, it was Pluto, Hades, and if it was the 12 Greek gods, then I would have more truck with it because the Greeks were they didn't pretend not to be human in their appetites and in their capriciousness and in their unreasonableness. They didn't present themselves as being all seen, all wise, all kind, all beneficent. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac, utter maniac, totally selfish, totally. We have to spend our life on our knees thanking him? What kind of God would do that? 
Yes, the world is very splendid, but it also has in it insects whose whole life cycle is to burrow into the eyes of children and make them blind. They eat outwards from the eyes. And why? Why did you do that to us? You could easily have made a, a creation in which that didn't exist. It is simply not acceptable. So, you know, atheism is not just about them not believing there is a, is not believing there's a God, but on the assumption that there is one. What kind of God is he? It's perfectly apparent that he is monstrous, utterly monstrous, and deserves no respect whatsoever. The moment you banish him, your life becomes simpler, purer, cleaner, more worth living, in my opinion. That sure is the longest answer to that question <laughs> that I have about in this entire series. <laughs> my welcome um, to you this evening. Thank you for coming out on a fairly cold um, Thursday, November evening to hear a talk on suffering. And uh, as I have already said, this is um, one of the most difficult, one of the most heartfelt questions and one of the biggest barriers to faith. Why is there so much suffering in life? Why the Grenfell Tower fire in which 79 people died, including many children? Why the wars in Syria and Iraq, civil war in Sudan? The list is endless. Why Ebola virus? Why homelessness? <coughs> Why robbery? Why murder, human trafficking? racial tensions, why earthquakes and tsunamis and flooding and hurricanes. And we've been reminded um, through this interview with Stephen Fry on Irish TV of the form in which the question can sometimes come. Stephen Fry says, how dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world so full of injustice and pain? The question of suffering is not simply an intellectual question, not even for Stephen Fry. And suffering affects all of us. It's the one thing that affects everyone. I wonder what has been your experience. Perhaps it's illness. Perhaps it's caring for somebody with an illness. Perhaps it's a degenerative illness where they're just not getting better. Maybe it's grief. Maybe it's family breakdown. Maybe it's depression or insomnia or just feeling like life is out of control. Our story is that my husband, Conrad, <coughs> fell at the age of 11 and um, banged his head on, on a, a hard wooden floor. And what happened after that has never been fully understood by um, clinicians. And we know how to treat it now. Actually, very recently, we, we learned how to treat this condition. But that this condition doesn't properly have a name. You know, here we are in Cambridge where we're told very often that science and medicine and technology can answer many of the questions. Some believe every, ultimately, will answer every question that we have. But what do you do when science and medicine has nothing to say? And that is the case for a good number of people in our medical system, in our hospitals. Now, we are well at the moment. We are mostly well, but occasionally life descends into chaos. And some of our biggest challenges have been coping with this as a family of four. To the question of suffering, there are no easy answers. And I'm not here for one minute to say that there are. Suffering is deeply mysterious in many ways. 
But just because we don't have all of the answers doesn't mean that there are no answers at all. Just because we can't say everything doesn't mean we can't say anything. I believe there are some things that we can say that make more sense of our messed up world. And here's the start. Here's a starting question. If you have ever asked why, to whom are you addressing the question? Because if God does not exist, there's no point asking why, because there's no one to ask. You know, the late Christopher Hitchens, the best-selling author and atheist and author of the book God Is Not Great, was diagnosed in 2011 with cancer of the esophagus, which turned out to be terminal. And he was interviewed on CNN in 2011 about whether, and he was asked by the interviewer whether he was tempted, despite his atheism, to ask the question, why me? And he responded, in this way. He said, you can't avoid the question. However stoic you are, you can only bat it away as a silly one. Millions of people die every day. Everyone's got to go sometime. A response that seems pretty bleak, especially since he has now died. And yet, it is entirely consistent with his atheism. Because if God does not exist, there's no point asking why, because there's no one to ask. This is just the way the world is. DNA makes mistakes, accidents happen, and the solution is to live as best you can because this is the only life you get. Well, the problem with that view is it seems to work fine in the lecture theater. It doesn't work so fine when a relative is fighting for their life in the operating theater. You see, what do I do with the sense of outrage that I experience when I see suffering in the world, when I see loved ones struggling? You know, Stephen Fry's reaction is so interesting. His atheism tells him this is just the way the world is. But it's as though that is not enough. That's not sufficient. There's a strong sense of injustice in the way that he frames the question. But where does that come from if my beliefs tell me this is just the way the world is? And as Gay Byrne says to Stephen Fry, that sure is the longest answer to that question that I've ever had in this entire series for a God that Fry does not believe exists. The Christian faith makes sense of suffering by saying there is something wrong with the world. This is not just the way the world is. There is something wrong. Well, now we're talking about right and wrong, good and evil. How do we define these things? And there are many competing explanations offered to us in society today. One is that they come from within. There's an internal moral law that you determine, you decide. Do what's right for you. That might not be right for someone else, but that's what's right for you. And that's fine when you're deciding where to buy your next pair of shoes or washing machine or whatever it is. But when you use that for moral decision making, you run into problems. You see, what if doing what's right for you brings harm to somebody else? What do you do then? Many of you will remember the summer of 2011 when some of our cities descended into chaos. There was that three day period where there was kind of rioting and looting. It was slightly odd. And there was a, a, a looter in London who was interviewed on Radio 4 as to why he was doing what he was doing. And he, he said, look, every man for himself sees the moment. Do what's right for you. And he was asked whether he would mind if his own home was looted. In the process, he lived in London as well. 
Well, his reaction was one of outrage. That would be utterly unacceptable. And this is a common reaction to an individualistic ethic. What's right for us is fine until it's turned on us and comes knocking on our own door, quite literally. And then we start to invoke higher moral laws that apply to more than one person at a time. True for you, but not for me, is simply not the world that we live in. You see, the Christian perspective says that moral values do not come from within. They come from outside. They come from something or someone bigger than us. Good is defined by who God is. God is a being in whom there is no darkness at all, who has no malice, whom you can trust. And therefore, good is unchanging. It is a standard that does not change, regardless of the time point in history that you happen to be born, regardless of the culture that you happen to be in, regardless of your upbringing and social context. Goodness is a standard that is fixed and unchanging. It is defined by the God who is good. Evil is anything contrary to not just what God does, but who he is as well, and is personified as Satan. He is the personification of evil, a being who has some degree of influence for now in this world. And so what I'm trying to say to you is that the Christian faith actually makes sense of the rawness that we feel when we suffer. Because we don't live as though this is just the way the world is. And the Christian faith gives voice to that rawness. It says, you are absolutely right. There is something wrong. It is the Christian faith that enables you to say that. Because evil exists as well as good. The Christian faith enables you to call evil, evil. Well, here's another question. This is a different type of question. If God is so loving, why is there so much suffering? This doesn't ask whether God exists. It asks, what is he like if he does? Because at the heart of many of our objections to the Christian faith is an assumption that God, if he exists, cannot be trusted, is morally dubious. And as Stephen Fry put it, clearly a maniac totally selfish and utterly monstrous. And it go, the reason it goes something like this, given the suffering in our world, if God exists, then he mustn't be all-powerful. He must be some frail old man who would dearly love to help, but sadly can't, and the events of life are spiralling out of control. Or, He's not good. He's actually malevolent, picking people out for punishment like some sort of divine sniper from the sky. Or maybe it's worse than that. He has favorites. You have a good life because you're my favorite. You have a difficult life. You're not. Or maybe it's even worse than that. He's lazy. He has the power to help, but chooses not to like some sort of delinquent superhero. None of these portray a very attractive God. Certainly not one that I would be willing to follow. A loving or powerful God would presumably create a loving world, right? Well, here's another question to think about. How is it that love is expressed? You know, my husband proposed to me three times. You won't mind me telling you this. I should say that the second and the third times were fairly close together after he could be fairly sure that the second yes was was going to stick. There was lots going on there. Partly that coming to terms with actually uh, marrying someone when they already have an illness and knowing that you're going to take a vow that says in sickness and in health, well you already know there's a sickness there. 
that wasn't straightforward, and that's part of the reason why I took so long. How is love expressed? You see, the significance of a marriage proposal is that the person asks the question, and the person responding chooses whether they will say yes or not. And it is a risky business, because the answer could be no. You see, love is expressed within the context of freedom. At the heart, to be able to express love, you need to have choice to say yes or no. And God is love. Right at the core of his being, God is love and has made a world where love is possible precisely by giving human beings meaningful choice so that love can be expressed. But the caveat of that is sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong. And some of the suffering in the world, not all by any means, but some suffering is caused by our choices, is it not? Perhaps you can remember times <coughs> when uh, you have caused the suffering of someone else. Perhaps you can remember times when someone else brought suffering to your front door. You see, the Christian faith says that there is something beautiful but broken about people. We are beautiful and we are broken. It's not that there are good people and bad people good and bad, reside together in the human heart. And therefore the problem of evil and suffering is not simply out there in the world, on the news, in our schools. It's also in here. You see, the Christian faith says the reason for that, the ultimate root problem, is that there's a brokenness between us and God. Someone called Isaiah hundreds of years before Jesus ever entered the scene, said, described humanity like sheep, not a particularly flattering description, but he said, we like sheep have gone astray, and each of us has turned to our own way. Sin is a very loaded word. It conjures up all kinds of images, and there's really only one to worry about. It's the one with a capital S that says, I'm doing this my way. I'm making my choices. I'm running my own life. I don't need you, God. And that leads to all kinds of other layers of brokenness. How we relate to ourselves. Shame. The choices that we make. How we relate to other people. Relational brokenness. And probably even our very biology. It's as though our DNA has been dragged along into this state of affairs. There is something beautiful but broken about people. You know, very often, when we're suffering, we're tempted. I don't know if you've ever asked the question, even if you don't believe in God, sometimes we think, is God punishing me? Is this happening because I'm and being punished for something that I have done. And I want to say, no, that is not the case. The reason you are suffering is because we live in a broken world, because things are not as they should be, because humanity is out of kilter with its maker. And it's not personal, it's global. Everyone is affected. You are not being singled out as though you need to learn something that nobody else does. We live in a broken world, and we're all caught up. But here's an interesting, or here's a, a question that follows on from that. Does God care? So what? We live in a broken world. So what? God's given us free choice so love can be expressed. Well, that God doesn't have to experience what it's like to live here. 
what kind of God are we talking about here? One time, um, my husband Conrad was ill for um, a three month period. And this was a, a difficult time because my children were toddlers and um, we felt very upheld by our church community in a lot of different ways. People brought us meals when I didn't have time to cook. People helped us look after the children. Um, people um, prayed for us. I also became aware of the different ways that we react to hurting people. You know, we're awkward, aren't we? We're awkward around hurting people. We don't know what to say. We don't want to name the elephant in the room. We don't know whether to mention it or not. And we're awkward. And I, I've been that. And I'm sure you have as well. And sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. And I found that I was most at home at that point with people who have been through something similar. There's something about a shared experience of pain that, that brings comfort because they get it. They get it. And you don't have to use words. But what does God think? And if he was, good, if he was to walk into the room what, what would he be saying to me? Would he be avoiding the elephant in the room? Would he be awkward around me? What kind of God are we talking about? And why does it feel like he stays so distant? Why doesn't he come and figure out what it is like to live here on earth in this messed up world? Why doesn't he make himself more obvious? Why doesn't he get his hands dirty? Well, the extraordinary thing is that he did. He did that. This is what we are about to celebrate at Christmas, but we've lost it. We've become anesthetized to the enormity of what we're actually talking about. We, we're focusing on Santa and socks and reindeer and red wine. This is God coming from heaven to earth. A God who became one of us. To face suffering head on. Didn't shy away. Came to earth and looked hurting people in the eye. And didn't say, sorry, this is just the way the world is. Live as best you can. It's the only life you get. No. He looked people in the eye and did something about their suffering. He healed people with diseases. He brought people who were isolated and lonely and on the margins of society back into the center. He even reached into death itself and raised the dead. He brought hope where there was deep despair, where there was no prospect of any change. Hope is what he brought. And he also suffered like us. Many people wear crosses around their neck today. You know, that's a symbol of, that's a, an execution, a method of execution. Um, right at the heart of the Christian faith is, is a symbol of, of suffering and death. Um, of a man who was arrested and tried and subjected to a miscarriage of justice of someone who was sentenced to death and then was betrayed by his closest friends. Have you ever been betrayed? Did you know that Jesus has experienced this? And if you come to him in your sense of betrayal, you speak to somebody that knows. And he was disowned. Have you ever been disowned? And he was flogged and he was beaten within an inch of his life and probably should have died during that process. The Romans knew how to kill people pretty well. And then he was made to carry wood up a hill and nailed to a cross and left to die of asphyxiation, bleeding and naked. And Isaiah again talks about Jesus hundreds of years before this event and describes him as someone who was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar 
with suffering. Sometimes the best people to be around are those that just get it. I don't know what life has thrown at you. I don't know what you have been through. But God knows. He knows. He sees you. And he knows. And not just in an intellectual way. He knows because he has been there. He has suffered like you. And therefore, if you turn to him, you turn to someone that understands and will not judge you. And the interesting thing is that he didn't just suffer like us. There is a sense in which the suffering of Jesus goes way beyond anything that we have ever been through. Hard as that might be to imagine. You see, something was happening while he was hanging on the cross that we can't capture with movies or historical descriptions. He was carrying the full weight of the wrongdoing, of the sin of the whole of mankind, quite literally bearing down on his shoulders. And that meant that the father and the son were separated for the first time in all eternity. And so Jesus was isolated and in a place of deep, deep, cosmic darkness, blackness. He, he said, this, I will die so that you can live. That's why, that's why I did that. Jesus says, I will take your pain and your suffering and your regrets and your mistakes, and your guilt, and your shame. I'll take that upon myself, and I'll take it to the grave, and leave it there, so that you can have forgiveness, so that you can know comfort, you can know restoration, you can know hope, where there is despair. That is what was happening there, hard as it might be to imagine. Jesus came and did for us what we cannot do, what we could never have done for ourselves. I will die so that you can live. There is living that I have for you beyond this. Some of you feel like your best days are behind you. That's not what he says. He says your best days are ahead of you if you live them with me. I have an adventure for you. I will die so that you can live. Some of you might be wondering what difference a man on a cross makes. Sometimes it's helpful when a situation, when a relationship is so broken, you need a mediator. And for that mediator to be effective, they need to understand the problem, but not contain, to not be part of the problem. If they don't understand, they can't help. If they're part of the problem, they can't help. To solve the problem of evil, you need someone who understands the problem of evil in this world, but does not themselves contain any. Only one person meets those criteria. The person of Jesus Christ. There is no one else like him. I came to understand this, having never believed in God before that. And I now see the difference that it makes in the real world. You see, Jesus, who had, said, did, thought, no evil ever allowed himself to be consumed with the evil of humanity so that you and I never have to be consumed by evil, either in this life or in the life to come. Evil doesn't have to have the last word. There is hope. And the incredible thing is that Jesus did all of this and he went through death and out the other side. He took it all to the grave and then he went through death. God is indestructible life. Death couldn't hold him. And he is alive today by the Holy Spirit and that is why there is hope for us because he 
is alive. And he has done this for anyone that will accept it without destroying our freedom. You see, this is, I think this is beautiful. We are still free to exercise our freedom. Sin and evil and death have been defeated on Calvary, but you and I are still free to either say no thank you or yes please. But we can still exercise our freedom. But he says to us, you can go through this without me or with me. What will you choose? He doesn't always offer us answers. But he does offer you himself. Very briefly, I want to say one more thing. If God is real, why doesn't he just get rid of evil and suffering once and for all? Well, the Christian faith is one day he will. Evil has been defeated on Calvary on that first Easter Sunday, but it hasn't yet been removed. But one day it will be removed. But if it's true that evil resides in the human heart, I don't want to be part of the evil that God removes. But one day it will be removed. And that's what Christians mean by heaven, but that's not so much heaven as a new heaven and a new earth that will be every bit as real as this life, but in which there will be no evil, no suffering, and God will wipe every tear from our eyes where you will see God face to face, where he will put right the injustices of this life. There will be justice where there has not been justice here. And this is why Christians talk about having hope. But the reason that day has not arrived yet is to give you and I time to get our choices right before God. Because much as I would love to say we will have a chance to rant and rave at God, I rather suspect it will not be that we ask questions of him, but he will ask questions of us. Why did you live that way? And my hand was outstretched. And there was life for you. It's an incredible invitation in the person of Jesus Christ. I believe it is the best news you will ever hear in this life of uncertainty and what is going to happen with Brexit and all of these other things. There is one thing you can be certain of. You are loved by God. He has died so that you can know freedom. He asks you today, how do you want to use your freedom? Whatever life has thrown at you, you can go through it without me or with me. What would you choose? And I'm aware that in the room, there are people at all kinds of different stages of your journey. People who have been thinking about this for a long time, and there are people who have just started to think about this. But I really want to invite you, if you would like to begin journeying with God this evening, or if you would like to ask me more about it, then please come and chat to me afterwards. I have a, a little booklet that I would love to give you. I want to thank you for listening and um, there will be a chance to, to ask questions in a few minutes and I'm going to hand over to Vic. Sharon, thank you so much for giving us absolutely masses to think about and some questions for us to consider for ourselves. But I'm aware that it might also have raised many questions in your mind. So we're now just going to take a couple of minutes. Um, we'd love you to write down questions and then um, Sharon will um, answer um, some of them. So if you want to um, pick up your pens and paper, if you've got a question, write it down. And um, if you wave it in the air, um, someone will come and collect it from you. And then in exchange, they will give you another card back because the feedback form is on the back of the question card. <laughs> so we don't want you to miss the opportunity to give feedback. So if you'd like to write those down now, we'll just take a two minute break. <laughs>
those who are suffering more than they can handle. Um, you mentioned that he will one day remove all suffering, um, but why not now? Thank you. Um, I feel like this is a very um, heartfelt question. Um, and, um, you know, I think that we have to, you know, we can say why in general um, suffering occurs. But when it comes to why is this person suffering and this person suffering, then this is where we, we begin to enter you know, an area that becomes very hard to, to give a, a, a definitive answer. And I think that, um, and, and I think that um, you know, the, day, the felt reality of suffering is something that I, I absolutely identify with. And I think that that's an absolutely valid question to ask. I feel like you find it in scripture as well. I don't know if you've read the Psalms. They're about, God, why? Why? This is just awful. And it's actually about people being real with God about their situation rather than feeling like we need to sort of be polite to God and then rant and rave at our friends but actually God says look um, bring it to me um, I don't know is the answer and um, but what I do know is that um, can you just read the question again or could I just have yeah, a yeah. card You know, I, ha I have a friend who has um, MS and um, her suffering is getting worse and it's getting worse day by day and uh, we, you know, uh, you know why, why would God not do something about that? I, I think that we don't know, we don't understand. What we do know is that God offers us, he, he wants to be alongside us in our suffering. I do believe that um, 
life is more bearable with God than without him in, in, in a world of pain. I do believe that he gives us strength that we didn't know we had. Um, I believe that he can bring hope where we thought there was no hope possible. That's not to say that he, you know, that, that things end up happily ever after. Of course not. That's not the world that we live in. But he does promise ultimately one day all suffering will be resolved. Um, and, but we're in this, this world where good and evil are at play and some of the play out of that is, is deeply mysterious. You know, um, the very first book of the Bible uh, chronologically is about a man called Job and, and it's, um, who suffers greatly. He suffers um, relationally, um, he suffers uh, physically, he gets very ill. He also suffers from natural evil, from hurricanes and, and, um, and storms destroying his, his livelihood. So multiple layers of suffering. And what, um, what, what we see there is uh, that there's a good and evil going on. And Job is not actually party to that bigger perspective. God, God is, but, but Job isn't. Um, and I feel like in, on one level that's quite comforting that the, chronologically the first subject that God spoke about is the one that is so universal to our experience that suffering is raw and it is real and I think he wants to be with us in it is the, is the, the best answer that we have Thanks Sharon um, Another question here you explained about our choice between good and evil but I'm not sure you answered Stephen Fry's question as to why a loving God allows innocent children to suffer, and um, those who don't yet know enough about the moral dichotomy between good and evil. Yes, thank you. Um, and I think, um, thank you. I think that um, that's, a good, that's a, a good question and a good point. Um, part, I hinted at it at one point in the, in the talk, and Stephen Fry raised some you know, really heartfelt situations there are a few things that we can say so the Christian faith says that there's a brokenness that affects every layer of, of what it means to live on this earth and that includes our biology which is partly how Christians um, explain why there is sickness and disease and again if God doesn't exist then there's nothing wrong as such it's just it's a chance event bone cancer in children it occurs by chance alone if you you know, consider the number of DNA pairs in, in the, the double helix and the number of cells in the human body and the number of people on the planet, then chance alone will account for bone cancer in children. If you're going to call it wrong, you need to say why. And that makes sense if God exists, not if he doesn't. And so um, there's a brokenness that even has almost dragged our, our DNA into it. It seems inc incredibly unfair and not right. Um, modern medicine is something I believe God given that he's given us minds that can make sense of the world and he's created a world that is ordered so that we can make sense of it and um, the medical profession has its roots in uh, early Christians who believed that people were not being punished for the illnesses that they had and were starting to develop medicines and technologies that can treat them that is the base, that's, that, that's the roots of hospitals and of the Christian uh, and, and the concept of medicine. And I believe that that is God's hands and feet to um, people that are struggling with illness and sickness, including those of children. Um, there, um, the, 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 the worms that eat outwards from the eye, the, you know, there's something that we can say there about the impact of poverty and injustice. You know, the reason that there are these worms is because there isn't sufficient clean water and children are standing in kind of, you know, water that's not clean. And, and so there's, you know, that there is a role for humanity there and to say, actually, there's something about uh, the distribution of wealth in the world and uh, the injustice that, um, that many people experience can partly explain why there are uh, insects that eat outwards from the eyes, in the eyes of, of children. And so, yeah, that's some things that we can say about that. I think we, we kind of grasp as we go that 
that these are really big questions, aren't they? And you, you can, um, yeah, like, we can't give simple answers. Um, someone's asked here, um, what do other religions say about suffering? I wonder if you could just give us maybe a couple of examples of where other religions perhaps differ or, or are the same as Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, um, so Buddhism, for example, um, would say that um, all of life is suffering. Um, it originated from a, a prince that began uh, as a as a Hindu, um, and actually, if you suffer as a as a Hindu, and again, I, I'm, I'm kind of summarising uh, and oversimplifying, and these are very complex ideas. But if you, um, you know, in, in Eastern thought. Um, uh, suffering uh, belongs to this reality, but the goal is to transcend this reality into a higher state, which is um, not a personal state, it is an impersonal state. Uh, and so uh, if you suffer uh, in, in Eastern thought, it's because you're only part of the way on your journey to transcendence, and the goal is to discard that sense of individual pain or joy for that matter and discard that sense of um, the personal and transcend into the great consciousness which is impersonal and so that actually um, in a sense says that if you if you suffer that's something that you need to try and move beyond which is different to, to what the Christian faith is saying actually you, you don't need to sort of transcend this you can name it and sit with it and acknowledge that it is real it's not something you need to ignore or suppress I guess another concept in, in Eastern in thought is is karma where life is cyclical and that if you suffer it is because you have done something in a previous life that has come to bear on this life and therefore you are responsible and there's a role for kind of working that off for the life to come and that's where all of these different spiritual practices and exercises come into play and you know the Christian faith again says something very different that you suffer because there's something wrong with the world you suffer because evil is real but you're not responsible for it in, in a sense that it's just it's part of a bigger picture that is playing out and so um, and I guess the thing that is, is really unique and is either loved or, or, or despised in some ways is that actually the Christian faith speaks of a God who suffered and that's anathema in, in, some, uh, in some respects but is this incredible intervention into our suffering if it's true, if it's real and if it's true. Um, this might have to be our last question, but there, are, there is opportunity to keep on going um, afterwards. Um, uh, consciousness makes suffering worse, doesn't it? And uh, why do you think God gave us consciousness? Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> End an easy one. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting that you've asked me this question because I have just um, finished. Um, writing a book called Am I Just My Brain that is coming out next um, summer. Um, so I spent um, 10 years on brain imaging where uh, you know huge leaps forward have been, have been made in trying to understand the interaction between um, the brain and the mind. I could say more about that later. But this thing, consciousness, is something that has baffled philosophers and, and scientists for millennia. Um, and I guess the fact that we are conscious makes us more likely, we're more susceptible to pain. I, I guess I, uh, perhaps that's partly what the question is getting at, that we are conscious beings and therefore, and perhaps we're, I mean, we know that animals experience pain as well, and as you go down the kind of levels of complexity, perhaps that decreases, but there are levels of consciousness in in the animal world as well, and therefore capacity to experience pain. Why do I think God gave us consciousness? Um, my PhD didn't inform my view, but my work over the last few years has certainly informed my view. 
Um, I believe that um, God gave us consciousness so that we can know him because we encounter him through our consciousness and the fact that we are conscious to an extent that no other creature is and that we have this capacity for language and relationality is there because there is an ultimate relationship that we are made for and because we are made by a God who is conscious and has made us um, and it's almost like consciousness is a bit like a radio antennae that is made to pick up signals. And there are signals from this world, from other people, that we pick up through our consciousness. But could it be that there are signals from outside of nature as well? And as you look at the phenomenon of consciousness, we see that the laws of nature cannot account for consciousness itself. It can account for some of the workings of the brain, but consciousness is, is deeply mysterious and beyond that. And therefore, perhaps consciousness itself resides outside of nature in the Godhead. I believe that we are conscious so that we can know God. The, the flip side of that is that we experience pain. Um, but um, there's hope in our pain and suffering and one and it has been it has had the wind taken out of its sails. There is life available, there is daily hope and there is ultimate hope because one day we will be fully conscious of God if we choose him. And um, that is ultimately what what is promised in scripture. That is what the Christian faith is all about. Sharon, thank you so much. I'm really excited to read that book. I'm so sorry that we're going to have to leave it here. Sorry for those of you whose questions didn't get answered. Um, but Sharon, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for um, giving us so much to think about and for um, dealing with it um, in such a, a thoughtful and considered way. Um, we have just got a small token of our thanks to you, um, which is coming shortly, but maybe we can offer um, Sharon our appreciation. <laughs> I will be here um, for a little while longer as well, so if I didn't answer your question, um, I'd be very happy to answer it one-on-one -on -one if you wanted to come up and say I asked this question. And, um, yeah. So thank you for coming, thank you for your time. Thanks so much. Um, there's just a few other things to mention. Um, firstly, another thank you. Thank you to Cecilia Brassett, um, who um, has organised us to be here um, in the lovely surroundings at Magdalen College. Um, thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, and then a few other things um, just to say. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, so if you've got a minute, just to um, scribble a bit of feedback down on the reverse of those question cards and hand it in on the way out. That would really help us as we plan future events. Um, and then, on the way out, everyone's getting a present, if you would like one. Um, so um, everyone, uh, feel free to take a bag. Inside is um, Sharon's book that she's talking about at the beginning. Um, obviously, this evening, we've only kind of skated across the surface of this topic of suffering. Um, but this deals with it in much more depth. Um, so um, do take that and read it if you'd like. Um, if all this talk about um, God and Jesus um, is something you'd like to know more about, we've also put in there one of the biographies of Jesus' life um, from the Bible, Mark's Gospel, um, well worth a read. And then we've also put in um, a little card with some of our Christmas services on um, at St Andrew the Great. You'd be more than welcome to join us any Sunday, um, and especially over the Christmas period. And I think there's also chocolate in here as well. Take the bag home. Um, but as Sharon said, there's now a chance to talk more. Um, Sharon's going to be around if you'd like to pick up things with her. Um, there are more drinks, there's wine and coffee back in that lovely room up there. Um, so if you'd like to talk things over um, with your friends who bought you um, or anyone else, um, then please um, head that way. But if you need to go, then head that way. Thank you so much for coming. We've loved having you.